All right, there we are. Sorry about that. Quick battery change. Okay, so today we are on to a new topic. We have a couple more things that we get to talk about together for the next couple weeks, which I'm pumped about. Um, it's the fun part of the semester because you guys know a lot already, and so we can start talking about some neat stuff. Um, so today and then maybe a little bit of Friday, we're going to talk about Java's error handling mechanism. So this is new, not something you've seen before, but it's a core part of the Java programming language, and it's a core part of many different programming languages. What happens when there's an error as part of your program? How do you handle that? And we're going to talk both about different ways to handle errors and then different ways to generate errors in certain cases where somebody has performed an action using your code that's incorrect, right? How do you signal that to, to people? Um, this also introduces us to a new code flow mechanism in Java, and that's one of the reasons it's important to talk about. So what we've been showing you so far is this sort of linear sequential execution where, you know, when I run your code, I go line by line. If there's a loop, I repeat the loop. If there's a conditional, I might choose which arm of the conditional to enter or whatever. Um, exceptions introduce a new, um, you know, exceptional code flow, right? Where I can actually jump out of a function several levels up into another statement when an error is thrown. All right, so let's talk about why this is the case. So when you're writing code, or when you're running code, there are things that go wrong. There are unexpected situations, um, or sometimes errors caused by you, the program, right? So we're gonna distinguish between these two as we talk about errors in Java. There's times when something in the environment surrounding your program uh, doesn't work out the way you thought. For example, maybe the network goes down. There's other times where you, as a programmer, make a mistake. You guys have done plenty of that this semester. That's part of how you learn. And you've seen some of these already. Some of you have asked us questions about what does it mean if I have a null pointer exception? Or what does it mean if I have an array index out of bounds exception, right? Um, you know, what happened? This is usually the result of some type of programmer error. And there's places in your code where generating exception is also the right thing to do. So this is something that you can both use as a programmer as far as handling exceptions, but there's also places where you want to be able to generate your own exceptions. We've run into this a couple of times where we had to kind of think about, okay, what happens if somebody gives us bad inputs to a, a function? So, for example, here's our, uh, this is sort of a variant of a class we looked at earlier when we, talk, when we were talking about uh, classes. So here's a class that's designed to store some number of strings. Kind of a silly class, you could just store these in an array or an array list, but imagine that I have this, and my constructor for the class takes an argument that specifies how many strings um, I'm going to store. What if I pass an argument that's either zero or negative to this constructor? There's no way in Java to actually um, kind of ensure that this constructor can ever be called with that argument, but if I get an invalid argument, particularly in a constructor, it's a little um, confusing about what I'm supposed to do. Partly because, as a reminder, a constructor always has to return an object. So there's no way to return null here, um, and that might be, not be the right thing to do anyway. So what do I do in this case? I've been given invalid input. Is there a way that I can signal to the caller of the method that you have used this function improperly? My documentation says uh, that storage size must be positive, but what do I do if somebody didn't read that documentation or messed up or didn't understand how to use this and provided me with a bad input. Uh, so that's, that's one case. Um, here's another case. Sometimes, you know, again, you get bad inputs and you try to use them and something wrong might happen. So um, there's this, you guys used this on, on I think, a, a homework problem maybe in the past or on one of our quiz questions. Um, there's a function that Java provides as part of the integer library that will parse an int from a string. So if you give it the string one zero, it'll parse that as the integer 10. But if I give it a bad value, what happens? What if I pass it foo or some other string that doesn't parse properly to an integer? Then what happens? So this might happen because this is part of the app that you're building for your final project. So maybe you take input from the user into a particular field, and then you're trying to convert that to an integer so you could do something with it. But what if the user writes, I'm trying to break your app? instead of giving you a valid string um, that you can convert to an integer. So what do I do here? So this is, you know, again, you know, this is one of the places where we get to sprinkle some new stuff back into to our life as Java programmers. We haven't talked about Java syntax for a while, 
but there's a few little bits you guys haven't seen. This is probably one of the last ones, actually. So Java has special syntax for this, um, and a special control uh, flow structure associated with exceptions. It's called a try-catch block, okay? Um, so this is a block. This introduces a new block in the same way that for loops do and if else statements do. Um, so I, I st the statement starts, always starts off with the keyword try, and then I have a block of code. Inside that block, I can do things that might generate an exception. And then what I have down here at the end is a catch statement followed by the exception that's going to be caught, and we'll look at a couple variants of this. And then I have a block of code that runs if the try block generates an exception, and only if the try block generates an exception. So if something that I stick into my try block causes an exception to be thrown, this is the terminology in Java, then it's caught in the catch block. And this statement determines what type of exception this catch block is going to catch, okay? Now, one of the things that's important to understand here is when an exception is thrown in the try block, control flow immediately jumps to the catch block. It's not like I finished the rest of what I was trying to do in my try block and move to the catch statement. I immediately jump into the catch statement and start executing code inside the catch. Okay? So how does catch work? So try, we're, we're gonna look at examples of these, obviously, and play around with them a little bit. Um, but how does catch match the exception? So essentially, what catch will do is the catch statement will catch any exceptions that inherit from the exception that's included in this uh, statement right here. So this essentially says when the catch block, first of all, this says this catch statement will catch any exception that inherits from exception, capital E exception. In Java, that's a superclass that includes many different kind, but not all, of exceptions that Java code can throw. When the catch step block starts to execute, you have access to this as an object. So exceptions in Java are objects like almost everything else. When I throw an exception, what I end up with is an object, and inside the catch block, I have access to that object under the variable name e. So whatever I put over here, I can call this error or exception with a small e or whatever I want, right? There's a couple of sort of canonical names for this particular variable in catch blocks. And we'll see why this is important, because that error object has useful information in it about what happened and what went wrong. All right, so, and, and I try these in order. So here's an example where rather than catching every exception, I'm actually only catching a couple of different types of exceptions. So you'll see my first catch block is gonna catch null pointer exceptions, of which you guys have created a few in, in, your, uh, in your time in this class. And then my second catch block is catching exceptions of type array index out of bounds. So, and again, these are tried from top to bottom. So as soon as Java finds a catch block, that matches the exception that was thrown inside the try statement, it will execute that catch block. If it doesn't find one, we'll talk about what happens in that case in a minute. Um, but in this case, I have some code in here that's gonna run if my try block generates a null pointer exception. I have some code down here that's going to run if my try block generates an array index out of bounds exception. Once I'm done with this control statement, then I go on at the bottom. And I go on both if things, if I didn't generate an exception, but also if my catch block ran. So this is an important feature of the catch block. Catch is supposed to handle the exception. Now sometimes we'll see that catch can also regenerate the same exception. So sometimes I just wanna log what happened, but I still want the exception to cause the program to crash, for example, right? Um, but if the catch block runs, so let's say your code generates an all pointer exception and my catch block runs, then what's gonna happen after that is that I'm gonna move on uh, to here and continue, continue on, okay? Questions about this before we get too much farther? Yeah, yeah. What's the nature of what? You have to speak up a little bit. 
What's the expectation? So there's no expectation of the catch block. You can put any code in there you want, right? The catch block might perform some action that I need to take if the try block caused a certain type of error. Catch can log information. Catch might return a value that indicates that the, the function uh, failed to complete correctly. Whatever, yeah, it really depends on the situation. It's a good question. We'll see, it. we'll see a couple of examples of, of how to do this. So I can also catch multiple different kinds of exceptions in the same catch block. This is sort of like, now we're getting into the weeds here, but if I stick them in between this single pipe, this catch block now catches either null pointer exceptions or a legal argument exception. These are two different types of, of exceptions. So this is a very common paradigm. One of the reasons I want to talk about this, well, one reason is I want to show you guys as much of Java as possible, and error handling is actually really important. But another reason is this is a very common uh, primitive. There are many different languages that include this idea. So Python, for example, has a try accept uh, block. Right, um, Python obviously has different syntax. We don't use braces, uh, we use indentation to indicate blocks. Um, but this is the same thing in Python. Um, this is C++ has something similar. This is the same thing in JavaScript. JavaScript has the same thing. Go is a language did not initially have this construct. Um, they have a, had a different uh, idiom for handling errors. At this point, apparently, New versions of Go are actually going to introduce something like this because people who use the language um, sort of demanded it. Right? They got tired of having to use Go's error handling mechanism, which they didn't think was as good as this type of, of idea. Can I ask you guys to do me a favor? Please don't talk in class for the entire hour, right? Like, you guys can say a few words to each other, but I can hear that up here, right? There's a couple of conversations now that have started to span, like, the entire hour. So if you guys want to talk, like, don't come to class. That's all right. But don't talk the entire time. Thank you. All right, so let's do an example with these guys. All right, so I've got some code here. Um, this is a function called throw random error. Um, I'm indicating that it's gonna throw an exception, and we'll come back and, and talk about uh, why I have to do that in a minute. But here's what I'm gonna do. Essentially, I'm going to say, um, I'm gonna pick a random Boolean, so it's gonna be either true or false, and I'm gonna generate an exception. So I've got code in here that's intentionally incorrect, right? So my block here, what type of exception is this gonna generate? Who knows what's gonna happen? This is like really dumb code, obviously. David. Yeah, I create an object reference called it, I initialize it to null, and then I try to call one of its methods, all right? So that's clearly not going to work. Um, what about this? What type of exception is this going to throw or generate? What do you think? Yeah, I've got an empty array. This is an array of, of length zero, and I'm pulling, trying to pull the fourth element from it. All right? So let's run this, first of all. Oh, let's see here. Uh, why am I having this? Oh, right, okay, so, so, okay, so this, is, this is a good point. So right now, I can't even compile this code, right? Because the compiler is going to check for me uh, and make sure that I've caught any of what's called a, a checked exception, right? So right now, if I try to compile this, the compiler is gonna say, no, 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 you've told me you're gonna call a function that's gonna throw an exception and you haven't, you haven't thrown, um, you actually haven't caught that exception. So I'm gonna remove this for now and see if that allows this to work. But I just wanna show you guys what happens, okay? So here's what happens if I don't handle it. And you guys have seen, I mean, how many people have seen an old pointer exception at some point this semester? Okay, so you've seen this already, right? What happens if you don't catch an exception is it will bubble up from whatever function generated it and eventually the Java interpreter will crash. So if you don't handle this null pointer exception, then essentially when I ran your program, it crashed. I got a null pointer exception. Um, half the time, I'm gonna get an array index out of bounds exception, right? How many people have seen one of those this semester, right? Probably on the photo MP, right? Yeah, we did that one, remember? I know you guys have been trying to forget it. Um, all right, so, so this is what happens if I don't handle this, okay? Um, but I can handle it using this try-catch um, construct that I showed you just a minute ago. So now, let's put this inside a try-catch block. And for now, let's just catch any type of exception, right? Um, and what we'll do is we'll print it. Okay, so let me 
indent this properly. Okay. So you'll see execution doesn't fail anymore. So my program ran to completion without generating an error. It didn't crash. Okay. So let me show you a couple other things about this that are important to understand. So this try block will never reach this statement. Yeah, come on. Okay? So sometimes I see an exception. Sometimes I'm going to see, um, depending on which random number I get, I'm going to see either this or the null pointer exception. But I will never see that here statement. Okay? Why? Because when I call throw random error, half the time I get one error and half the time I get other, another error, but it never completes successfully. So I'm never going to reach that second line. So again, this is different code flow than we're used to seeing. And one of the more important things to understand about working with exceptions is how they affect the order in which your code runs. So as soon as a function generates an exception, I'm not going to continue executing code linear. Either the program's going to crash if I don't catch the exception, the way I just did using a try catch block, or I'm going to jump into the catch block that handles that exception. All right, so now let's look at how to handle these two exceptions separately. So let's say null pointer exception, okay? So now you'll see about half the time I'm going to, the program's going to uh, complete okay because I'm catching the null pointer exception, the other half the time it's going to crash because I'm not handling the other exception. All right, so let's now catch the other out of bounds exception. All right, and now I'll just, I'll print something else. So now about half the time, I'm going to get, you know, this, uh, this first exception, the other half, I'm going to print the name. When I print an exception, uh, by default, I get the name. There's other information in that object that's also useful, right? Um, but I can also, you know, print whatever I want. So I can put anything I want in this catch statement. So remember, the catch statements are executed in order. So if I put this statement up here, Remember, this is going to, both null pointer exception and array index out of bounds exception inherit from exception. So if I stick this in here, then I'm never going to get to either of those lower statements. Because as soon as I find a catch block that matches, I execute that code. I don't go on and execute the later code. Okay, questions at this point about how to catch exceptions. So two things to, to understand. You guys are going to get some practice this week with some homework problems on this. Um, number one, how to catch exceptions, right? Uh, number two, what happens when exceptions get thrown? Where, what happens to your code? Where does it continue to execute? Because again, this is different. We have never seen this before, right? Until now, if I showed you this, you would say, well, I run throw random error, and then I run the next line on line 17. But if throw random error generates an exception, it's inside a try catch block, I will not continue the try block. I do execute stuff before I get there, right? So I'll put this in here, top. That's going to get executed, because it's before uh, the, the thing that, that, that threw the exception. Okay, good. So. And, and again, let me just remind you, so exceptional, let, let not, now this gets even more interesting, right? So when an error is thrown by a function in Java, here's what happens. Java starts looking for a catch block. I've, I've thrown an error. Something has to catch it, okay? That catch block might be right, you know, around the place where the error was thrown, but it also might be somewhere else. And what Java will do is it'll continue going what's called up the stack. It'll go from the function that's running to the function that called that function to the function that called that function, looking for a catch block that can catch that error. If it doesn't find one, that's when your program crashes. So if Java gets all the way up and hasn't found any way to catch this exception, then the program will stop. And you'll see some output you know, at the console or in the log if you're using Android. 
So here's an example here. I've got, um, you know, four levels of function nesting. So foo1 is calling, sorry, foo4 is calling foo3, which is calling foo2, which is calling foo1. Foo1 generates a null pointer exception. So what happens when this code is executed is I'm running foo1, and there's an exception that's thrown, an exception of type null pointer exception. So Java says, is there a try statement here in foo1 that can catch this? The answer is no. It says, is there a catch block inside foo2? Foo2 called foo1. Maybe foo2 was prepared to catch an exception thrown by foo1. The answer is no. So now I go up to foo3. Is foo3 prepared to catch this exception? No. I keep going, I go up to foo4. Is foo4 prepared to catch this exception? Yes. Right, I have a catch statement that matches this exception type. And so now I'm going to execute the code inside this catch statement. So this is even more confusing than you thought originally, right? It's not just that I jump into a catch block, it's that I can jump into a catch block that can be multiple levels up from where the code is actually running. Again, if I don't find a catch block that can catch that exception, the program crashes. Um, but Java will look in the function, the function that called that function, the function that called that function, the function that called that function, all the way until it finds either a catch block that works or um, no catch block, in which case the program execution will stop. Okay, so, so again, you know, I can, I can show you this, this in action. Now, as soon as I find a catch block, I stop. Um, so let me put a print statement in here. We'll say caught. Right? So I caught it here. Um, if I put this in here, then I can catch it inside. And let's catch a null pointer exception. We'll do... Now I'm catching it in foo3. I could also catch that in foo2 or foo1. If I don't catch the right type of exception, so as I go up, I'm also checking the type of the exception. So if I, let's say I'm prepared to handle an array index out of bounds exception rather than array index out of bounds, then I'm going to go all the way to foo4. Because Java finds a catch statement in foo3, but it's not catching the right type of exception. It's not catching a null pointer exception, it's catching an array index out of bounds exception. And so um, I'm not gonna execute that block. Instead, I'm gonna go all the way up to foo4 before I find the, the code flow. Questions about this? This is probably, again, one of the more complex things to wrap your mind around about how errors are handled in Java, but also, again, in many, many other programming languages. This idea is reused in a lot of places. I throw an exception, you can think about throwing the exception up until it's caught somewhere. If it's never caught, the program crashes. If it's caught in the function that caused the exception, that's great. If it's caught in the function that called that function, that's great. If it's caught in the function that called the function that called the function that called the function that generates the exception, that's another place where it can be caught, if it gets up to that point. David. Yeah, let me come back to that. So the question is, do I have to declare that a function can throw an exception? And the answer is yes, sometimes. It depends on the type of exception. Right, so we're gonna get there in a few slides. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if it doesn't, the way you can think about it, if there's no catch block, um, it's, it's not going to, the error is never gonna be caught, right? So. So, I mean, you can think about it looking, you know, it looks in as many places as possible, right? So essentially, we'll look in all the enclosing functions to see if it can find a, a catch. If not, then you typically see it on the console. There are places, though, as, as David pointed out, where I do have to both declare that a function can throw an exception and catch the exception. And the compiler will check that for me, but we're gonna talk about those in a minute. Okay, other questions about this? Control flow. Like I said, you guys will see this on next week's quiz. You have some chance to practice with this um, this week on the homework problem. Okay. Great segue to types of exceptions in Java. So there's multiple ways that things can go wrong. Okay. 
Um, and Java breaks these down to a couple different categories. And it's really important to understand two of them because they directly affect how you program in the language. Okay? So checked exceptions, all right? What does checked mean? Checked here means checked by the compiler. So there are places where you know that something might go wrong in your code. When you're programming the code, you know that something might go wrong, right? Hey, guys in the back. Excuse me. Can you guys? Yeah, the two of you, please. Thanks. Um, so there are places when you're programming, like, let's say you're performing some sort of network operation, right? You're trying to make a web API request. You know, when is that going to fail? There's lots of different ways that can fail, but when's one way, when's one time that's definitely going to fail? You know that you can't return a result properly. I'm trying to make some sort of web API request. What do I need to do to do that that I don't necessarily always have? Yeah. What's that? Okay, I might need a key, that's a good point, but what, what other like basic thing about the world might be wrong? Yeah. Yeah, let's say I'm not connected to the internet. That's a problem, okay? So that's a type of checked exception, meaning that the, whatever code is responsible for making that request is going to tell you, hey, by the way, I know that sometimes when you call this function, I can't do the right thing. You want me to go make this web API request, and I get it, you made the function call perfectly, you specified all the right arguments, it gave me a key or whatever else I needed, but there's no network, so there's no way for me to, to, to do this. Right? Maybe the server is down, right? Maybe whatever. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways that this can fail, okay? So in certain cases when you're writing Java code, you have to actually tell, uh, you can tell somebody that an error might occur. The reason to do this is then the Java compiler can check to make sure that it's handled properly. We're gonna see examples of this, but this is what's called a checked exception. The big distinction here is as a programmer, you know that something can go wrong. Okay, you're aware of this as you're writing the code. When you write code that deals with a network, you should always think about what happens if the network isn't there. Or let's say the network was there when the function started and then the, right then the user disconnected or turned the Wi-Fi off or whatever, right? Okay, so, so places where as a programmer you're aware of something that can go wrong, it's also outside of your control. If you're aware of something that can go wrong that you can fix, fix it, right? But it's like, I, don't, I can't force the user to turn the network back on. Right? Or I can't do much if the user suddenly decides to turn the network off and I wasn't uh, prepared for it. Okay. Unchecked exceptions, right? So you guys have been making these all semester. All right? The reason why they're unchecked is the compiler can't check for them. The, and the, and the reason, now, you know, we can have a conversation about that in a minute because there's a couple places where you might think, wait, the compiler should be able to check that for me. But the reason that these are referred to as unchecked is the compiler does not check. These are almost always programmer error. These are your fault. You made a mistake. You thought the array had six elements and you tried to, ele uh, you know, and then only had three, and that caused an array index out of bounds exception. Or you didn't realize that a particular reference could be null and you tried to dereference it and that called a null pointer exception. These are mistakes. Now here's the thing. You don't know that you are about to make that mistake. If you did, you wouldn't make it, right? If you had a reference that you, uh, new could be null, you would check for it before using it, but you forgot, and so you messed up. And sort of by definition, you're not aware of the fact that this code might cause an error. The compiler's not either. So the idea is, with the checked exceptions, I have to tell Java that this code might fail. With the unchecked exceptions, if I could tell Java that the code might fail, I would know what I was doing wrong, and I would fix the thing that I was doing wrong, right? So these, by definition, really can't be declared to the compiler. I can't tell you that it's about to happen because I don't know. The reason I don't know is because I did something dumb, right? Um, so all the null pointer exceptions, the stack overflow errors you guys have been getting when your recursive functions don't exit properly, stuff like that. These are all examples of unchecked exceptions. Okay, so and there's a final category we're not gonna spend very much time on that are known as errors. And errors are like, times when the Java runtime itself has encountered some problem. And frequently, like, I can't go on. Like, I ran out of memory. That can happen, right? Systems only have so much, you allocated too much, or maybe somebody set up the, 
Java virtual machine only use a tiny amount, but anyway, you ran out. What do I do at that point? I don't know, crash. Like there's just no, there's nothing else to do, right? So there's this last category, I'm concluding for completeness, um, and these typically are not recoverable. Sometimes they're recoverable, um, but they're typically not recoverable. You don't need to worry about these too much. All right, but let's talk about the differences between the checked and the checked exceptions. So a lot of times, you can think about checked exceptions as happening because of some external failure that's related to how your code works, right? So for example, you were trying to use a file that was supposed to be included as part of your app, and the file didn't exist. It's like, okay, I wasn't expecting that, right? That something's wrong with the world, but I don't know what to do about it, right? So that's an example. Another one are these, um, you know, you, you tried to parse a particular string as a URI resource, maybe when you're trying to use some sort of internet resource, and that didn't work, right? So you got, um, you had some invalid inputs, right? Okay, so, I don't know why this is here. I'm not gonna talk very much about this, but, oh, I, I actually, you know, let, let, me, let me show you. So Java has all these different examples of ways that things can go wrong, right? So you'll see this is a particular type of exception that's used as part of the Java networking package. It's called a URI syntax exception. It says, a checked exception thrown to indicate that a string could not be parsed as a URI reference. It inherits from exception, but this is there because a specific piece of code in that package can throw an exception of this type. So we wanna be aware of that. So here's the thing about checked exceptions. They are checked by the compiler. What does that mean? It means that if you call a function that throws a checked exception, you have to catch it, okay? It has to be caught somewhere. Somewhere along the line, someone's gotta handle this situation. Okay, so you have two options, right? You can either catch it, right? that's one option. You call a function that causes a problem, sometimes you catch the exception and figure out what to do. Or you can declare that your function is going to throw it. Meaning that when you call the function that throws the exception, it's possible that it throws an exception and your function also throws an exception. So those are your options. The idea here is because these are checked, the compiler knows that they might happen and can help you handle it, all right? So, so here's an example of catching the exception. So this is the one that I just showed you, this URI syntax exception. So I've got this little, this is a dumb function, it's just basically wrapper code, right? Essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm gonna try to create a URI from this input. This, I looked up in the documentation, and this can throw a URI syntax exception if the input I provide to the constructor is invalid. And so what I've done is I've wrapped it in a try-catch block. So I'm saying, okay, well, you know, I try to create the URI, and if I, um, if it fails, then I'm gonna print this message, and I could return null. I should really return, I really need to return something in this function because it's declared to return a URI, so down here I could have a return null state. Right. So here's one, this is one example of working with the checked exception. Here's another example. So let's say I don't know what to do. So here's a, here's a way to punt the problem to whoever calls me, right? So what I can say is, my function, this is again a new piece of Java syntax for us that goes along with try catch. I can declare that my function can throw that exception. So now, here's the original declaration of my function. It's a static function that returns a URI called create URI that takes a string as input. I can only do that if I handle the exception that the, con the URI constructor may throw. Down here, I've had to modify the declaration of my function to indicate that it may throw this particular type of exception. So now what happens is, if the input that I pass to the cons URI constructor is invalid, it's going to throw an exception. I'm not handling it, so what happens? I throw the exception. Now, what does this mean? It means that whoever calls create URI now is calling a function that's declared to throw an exception. So they have to handle it. So again, I haven't made the problem go away. I don't wanna fool you into thinking that. I've just punted it to somebody else. I've said, you know what? I don't know what the right thing is to do here, but if you call me, you call this function, you've now gotta handle this problem, right? You have to handle the case where instead of creating a new URI like it's supposed to, the function throws an exception because you gave me a bad input. All right, so let's, uh, you know, this, this is why I use this example. Um, 
because we can actually experiment with it, right? So if you try to compile this code, remember these are checked exceptions, the compiler is smart enough to help you. So when I try to compile this code right now, I get a compilation error. Why? Because the compiler knows that the URI constructor can throw an exception. And it knows what kind. It's telling me right now, you haven't handled the case where the URI constructor throws an exception of type java.net.uri uh, syntax exception, okay? So let's put this in a try catch block. That was one of our strategies. So I can essentially say try, I think I can do catch. Uh, ex I'm gonna catch any type of exception here. I don't have to do that. I could only catch the URI syntax exceptions. And let's just say I'm gonna return null in that case. And I'll print a message just to indicate to the user or whoever's, you know, whoever cares that something went wrong. Okay, so now, this works fine if I give it a valid input. This is a valid URI. Let me give it a, an invalid URI. If I try to do this with like, okay, so now I've handled the exception. So I entered the, the catch block. The reason is I tried to create a new URI with just two forward slashes and the URI package was like, no, 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 that's not a valid URI. It has rules about how they look about the format. So I tried to create this, I got a bad input and I returned null. So that was one, that's one way that I could handle it. Okay, so good input. Um, looks like this. I'll just copy this so that we can mess with it down below. Bad input. Looks like, looks like that. Okay. One strategy for doing this, okay. The other strategy was to declare that this can throw an exception. Oop. All right, and now what I can do is just, I don't have to catch it. All right, so now what's gonna happen though? I'm still gonna have a problem here. I'm not gonna be able to compile this code. Why not? I mean, I don't, if I declare that I throw the exception, I don't need the try catch block, right? because my function is just gonna throw the exception, but what is the compiler gonna make me do? This is a checked exception. The compiler is helping me here, and it is gonna force me to handle it. So what do I have to do before this code will compile? I could try it, I mean, we can try compiling it. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it will compile. What do I need to do here? So now I've declared that my function is throwing an exception, but where is the exception being caught? It's a checked exception, it's never caught. So what do I have to do to fix this? I don't have a try catch inside the function, but yeah. Bingo. Yeah, I can't call the function outside of a try catch block. So what I can do is I can put these inside a try catch And then, and now, now I'm okay. One thing I wanna, and this is actually a great chance for, to point something else out. One thing I wanna uh, remind you of, right? And, and this is confusing sometimes when I have, so I'm calling a function println, and it's receiving the output of another function create URI. You'll notice that that second println does not execute. It doesn't print anything, right? Why? Because as soon as I run this create URI call, it throws an exception. And I immediately jump into that catch block. So I stop everything. I don't even finish executing that line. I can't, right? When, when create URI throws an exception, it doesn't return a result. The, the code stops immediately at that point. So again, I don't even, I start to execute line seven, but I never finish. Because as soon as create URI throws an exception, I jump into the catch block. So I only see the print statement that was run when create URI doesn't throw an exception. Questions about this before we go on? Yeah. So the, the question is, if I heard it correctly, when would it be better to throw rather than handle? Yeah, it's a, a great question, right? So the question is, you know, I showed you two options, right? One is to handle it. The other is to throw it. 
it really depends on what the code is and what it's doing, right? You see both, right? You see cases where, you know, essentially create your URIs like, look, I'm just a helper function. I don't know what you want to do if there's bad input, right? Um, but, you know, I can also do what I did before and return null or whatever. I mean, there's, there's, there's multiple strategies, right? Sometimes it's better to expose the fact that an error can occur to a, a point in the code that can actually handle it properly, right? Rather than trying to do the right thing and, and maybe not, not achieving the right result. So, yeah, it, it, this really depends, right? Um, as you guys go on and write more sophisticated code in Java or other languages, you will have, you will encounter this sort of thing and you will have different options at your, at your disposal for, for dealing. Yeah, great question. No good answer to it. Wisdom and experience. All right. So now, before the class, let's, let's get through unchecked exceptions. So again, as I promised, these are fundamentally the result of programmer error. You made a mistake. You messed up, right? Um, so again, you know, there, it's a, I'm trying to get this distinction across, and hopefully I'm succeeding. You can't check these because you didn't know you made the mistake. If the compiler was able to tell you made a mistake, it would have told you when it compiled, but it's not smart enough to do that, okay? Now again, you guys have made a lot of these by now, right? Array index out of bounds exceptions, right? You know, you walked out the end of array, null pointer exception, you didn't check for null before dereferencing something. Class cast exception, you guys saw some of those when we were working on polymorphism. Um, usually you try to downcast something to a subclass that's not an instance of. Um, what else do I have on here? Oh, legal argument exception, you passed a bad argument to a constructor, right? This is a useful exception to throw, which we'll talk about next time. Um, so yeah, these are, you know, these are out there, right? And these, and, and again, the reason that these get generated is because you messed up. And so there's no way to declare a function, there's no reason to declare a function to throw these because, you know, don't declare that your function throws a null pointer exception, don't generate it in the first place, right? That's, that's the right way to, to do things. Okay, so here, this is, this is our like little litany of, of these. Um, you guys are gonna have a chance to, um, to do some of these on homework. This is like fun, a fun chance to write bad code, right? Um, so let's see here, I can do, um, let's see, object it is equal to null, and then I'll do it dot hash code. So it's a handy little way to generate a null pointer exception. I'm not gonna finish this. I'm sure you guys will have a chance to do this on the homework. Um, you know, again, this is your one chance in the class to write intentionally bad code um, that, that, that makes these type of mistakes. But um, I will point something out, and this is something that may confuse you. So I just said that the compiler cannot check for these kind of errors. And you may be wondering, like, why not? You know, like, look, on line four, I declare an object reference called it, and I, do, and I set it to null, and then the next line, I try to dereference one of its methods. Like, why can't the compiler check that for me? And the answer is, that's a great question. Um, it probably can. There are, there are newer languages with much more powerful compilers that will not allow you to do this, right? This is really dumb, right? You kind of wonder, like, look, I've got this really powerful computer. You know, you've been telling me how magical it is, and yet it can't catch this error, right? I mean, there's not even like a few lines of code in between the declaration and me using it, right? To confuse the compiler a little bit. Like, oh, I could put like an int declaration in there just to throw it off the scent, right? Um, this is just like really, so, so the fact that Java can't catch this is, is sort of a, um, a relic of the fact that it's an old language. Newer languages, newer compilers are much more powerful and they will typically uh, be able to help you with stuff like this, right? Because this is the kind of thing that, you know, and, and you also might um, ask, why would I ever need to catch this? Because I will never make a mistake like this in my entire life, right? And I wish that that was true, right? Um, if you don't, you know, congratulations, right? But I have seen, you know, way more experienced programmers literally write code that is almost this dumb, right? Usually there's like a comment in between or something like that, right? Or it's like 3.30 in the morning or something and they've, they've, they've been working for a while. Um, but yeah, you do see stuff like this, right? Or almost that dumb. So again, unlike checked exceptions, I don't have to declare that I throw them. And the compiler can't force me to do that because it doesn't know when those are going to occur. But I can handle them, right? So I just saw on the previous slide, 
I can still catch, these are all unchecked exceptions. You'll see that my falter function does not declare that it throws anything, right? Um, and so I don't need to, the difference between checked exceptions is I don't need to declare that I throw them, but I can still handle them. Right? Um, and sometimes this is actually the right way to write code, right? There are times when, um, and I'll show you some examples, at least either in a few slides or on Friday, of places where try catch blocks can actually simplify error handling for, for slightly complex pieces of code, right? This is something that you guys are gonna wish that you would have seen in time for MP3, um, but may come in handy on your, on your final project. So, and, and you know, again, like this, um, here's an example, right? You guys are starting to work on your final project, right? You know, never trust your partner. Um, you know, particularly if your partner writes a method called call my partner's dodgy code, right? That's not a method that I would trust. Um, and so um, one thing I can do is instead, so what we've been showing you all semester, and this is not a bad strategy, would be check for null. Um, check for null on line three before I go on and do anything with that reference. But I can also do this, which is I can write the code that I want to run inside a try block, and then at the bottom, I have uh, you know, a place where I handle the messes that get made along the way. I catch exceptions that might occur, right? So if there's a null pointer exception anywhere in, in here, rather than the program crashing, I can do something to indicate that something went wrong. Okay, um, I don't wanna talk about errors for very long. Here's a couple examples. Um, a lot of times Java errors are still your fault um, because your program is misbehaving. So again, a stack overflow error is not an exception. But you guys now have a sense of why these get generated, right? Because your recursive function never hit a base case. And so it kept calling itself and calling itself and calling itself and eventually the area of memory that gets used to store the information about functions as they run, which is called the stack, runs out of space. And so a lot of times these are still your fault, but they're usually not things that you can handle as the program runs. Okay, let me see where I am on time. Oh, I've got two minutes left, okay. Um, well, let me, let me go through this and we'll sort of pick up here on Friday and talk a little bit about throw as well. Um, so, you know, errors, there's not much you can do about errors, right? That was the last category we looked at briefly. These are usually cases where the Java environment itself at that point is so broken that there's not much you can do other than crash. Unchecked exceptions, you know, the goal here is to avoid these. These are usually generated by program or error. Um, the, the problem, of course, is that, you know, these get generated at runtime. So again, you know, testing your code, writing tests, you know, making sure the tests don't crash is a good way to try to eliminate these types of errors, right? But your goal as a programmer should be trying to make these go away, right? Don't handle them, try to eliminate them. Don't generate them in the first place. Um, checked exceptions, you know, again, this goes back to the question that was asked early, right? Um, this really depends on what your program is doing and how you can handle the error. So for example, if you're writing an app and you ask the user for input, let's say you ask the user for something that you wanted to be able to convert into an int and they gave you bad input, what could you do? You could, you know, put up a message that says, that's not an int, you dummy. Like, give me something that looks like an int. Here are some examples. Um, you know, you could, you know, you know, produce some type of error message, right? But you probably want to prompt them and get them to re-enter the input, right? You should not crash, right? That's what you don't want to do, right? I mean, not, I mean, a lot of apps you guys use are probably pretty well tested, right? But if you've ever downloaded an app from the app store that doesn't have very many users, you might find yourself in a place where you can get it to crash by giving it back. All right, so on Friday we'll pick up, we'll finish up talking about exceptions, and we'll start talking a little bit about hashing. Um, the final product description is out. The fair is two weeks from tomorrow. Get started, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys put together. I have ops hours today from one to three. I will see you then. Good luck.